Good morning to you from Wyndham Center Church. Thank you for joining us. It is the first Sunday of the year, and it is a privilege to be able to come together with you as we worship the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We offer this time each week as a space for people to come apart from the noise, the busyness of life, uh, a time to bring your cares and concerns before the Lord. And uh, we hope that you receive encouragement and strength and nourishment as uh, you live forth this coming week. Uh, please join me in prayer as we start. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, we gather before you at the head of this new year. Thankful for your faithful presence, seeing us through all of the challenges that we endured uh, through 2020, and even just scattering gifts of grace as you have upon us, even through the struggles. And so we want to thank you for that today. We thank you for this new year that we uh, can trust you for going before us, for, for preparing this year for us to enter, prepare our hearts and our lives as we enter it. And so we thank you for that today. We just commit our hearts to hear you, to receive from you what you have given to us this morning. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As it is the first Sunday of the month, it is a Sunday on which we come to the table of the Lord for communion together. And uh, we will do that at the end of our time. If you have your elements, make sure they're prepared. And uh, we'll look forward to that in just a little bit. This morning, uh, as we read, I'm going to read a passage from the Old Testament, from the prophet Isaiah, and then a passage from Paul. And as I think about Isaiah and the passage that we're going to read from Isaiah 49, beginning with verse 1, it's a reminder that you and I, through our faith in the Lord, are joined together into a great past that announces for us a glorious future. And that is all connected to the Lord Jesus. And so here, Isaiah's promise of 700 years before Christ. Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. He concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore only the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you. I will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land, to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads. They will find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat nor the sun bear down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. Well, not only do we have the privilege of being joined to that glorious past of a, of a great promise for a future, we have a powerful message for our present 
as Paul gives us his ministry, not just to the Colossians, but to us and his encouragement to us, beginning with Colossians 1, verse 27. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, the nations, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He, that is Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And to this end, I strenuously labor with all of the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. And I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. The psalm that I'd like to read for us ahead of our prayer time this morning is a good psalm for the head of the year. It is Psalm 90. It was written by Moses. And the context is Moses leading the people in the wilderness. And that is the explanation for some of the harder words that Moses speaks. I Sometimes when I read this to someone in the hospital, I'll leave out a few of the harder sections. But for our worship, I think it is useful to, to hear the entire psalm. But as you hear it, think of Moses praying specifically over the people of Israel as they go through the wilderness and certainly many things applicable to us as we persist in the wilderness of this life. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. We are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger. We are terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength continues. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. They quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Oh, yes, Lord, establish the work of our hands. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, if one reality has faced us over this last year, it is certainly the the reality of our frailness, the reality of the finiteness of our lives. 
how we are so at the mercy of this world and the things that take place in it, whether it be the, the smallest of genetic particle, whether it be uh, the riots or violence that other people uh, commit, whether it be storms or accidents or disease. Lord, our human lives are so at the mercy of these things that happen all around us. And yet this psalm reminds us, Lord, that while our lives are temporary, your life is eternal. And it is to that eternal life that you love to invite people. Oh, Lord, it is to that eternal life that, that you pointed when you sent Jesus to us. And, and in the Gospel of John, we hear that you love the world so much that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, this life is temporary. It may last 70 years, or 80 years, or 90 years, or... 30 years or, or 20 years or less. And we are just reminded day by day of how much we need you. Oh Lord, would you continue to direct our hearts toward you as we begin this new year that, that our hearts, our lives, we would trust you each day. We would trust you for all that is to come, that you are greater than all that happens around us. And you would lead us if only we would let you. You would guide us faithfully if only we would follow. Oh, Lord Jesus, would you open our eyes to a bigger picture of who you are this coming year? A greater love, a deeper devotion, a more committed serving, usefulness to you, oh, Lord, and the joy that comes from knowing that we're being what you made us to be what you desire us to be. And so we seek that from you today. Lord, we continue to lift up uh, those who are suffering from COVID-19. Uh, it seems to be growing immensely in our little area. And uh, we're knowing more and more people who are experiencing its symptoms and having to deal with it. And we would lift them up to you. We want to lift up all of the caregivers, Lord, who are so weary and just laboring on and on and on. We just lift up all of the caregivers. We lift up our, our first responders who have to add a layer of caution and concern to everything they do. We lift up those who are laboring to, to get the COVID vaccine out and the struggles of making that happen. Lord, uh, in this season of ongoing political unrest while we wait for the inauguration in uh, a couple of weeks. Oh Lord, we just pray for your guidance and protection of our nation. Oh Lord, would you uh, just help us as we seek to, to just show your love and care to the people that we live among. Lord, hear us as in a moment of quiet we would pause and bring to you the concerns of our heart right now. Hear us, O oh Lord, we ask. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your favor today. And we ask that you would hear us as we join together in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Turn in your scriptures this morning to the book of Revelation. That is where we start today, book of Revelation, uh, beginning in chapter 1, and uh, I'll be reading there in just a moment. The second installment of C.S. Lewis's great children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, begins with uh, his four heroes, the children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy Pevensey, their two brothers and two sisters. They are seated at a railway station in England, and they are getting ready to return to their boarding schools for the new term. One moment, they're uh, sitting at the bench having a joyful conversation, and the next moment, they are being magically transported away. Uh, they don't know where they're going or where they are when they arrive there. They don't know when they are. They don't know why they are there, and they don't really know what to do next. It takes a few moments, but they finally do realize that they have turned to the realm of Narnia, a place that they had visited uh, in their lives a little while before. Um, and But they still have to figure out what they need to do. And their path leads forward, and it's full of stumbles. It's full of mistakes. It is full of setbacks. It is full of conflicts. It's full of bad choices as they try to make their way. Finally, as they're facing a great futility, the, the, the thing that they're trying to accomplish just seems out of reach, and they feel like they're going in the wrong direction. Well, finally, Lucy, who is the youngest, catches a glimpse off in the distance of, of a shadowy figure that she thinks is Aslan. Now, Aslan is the key figure in all of these chronicles. Aslan is the king. He's the king of Narnia, and he is the king, the, the great lion. Um, so she thinks that she sees him, and she wants to follow him, and, and that itself leads to an argument with her and her brothers and her sister and others. So they don't end up following him right away, and, and she's more and more uneasy about it, and that just leads to a disaster. They finally get to the point where she realizes that it's Aslan, and she's going to go to be with him no matter what. She sees him, and she talks with him, and after a while, her brothers and her sister join together, and uh, Aslan talks with them to help prepare them for what is next. It's in this context that Lucy looks at Aslan, and she says, Aslan, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one. She questions him, not because you are. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Every year you grow, you will find me bigger. In these stories of Narnia, Aslan, the king, it represents Christ. He is the figure of Christ uh, for this place. And the, the simple truth that Aslan just spoke for Lucy, I, I think is very apt and very applicable in your life and my life as well. Every year that you and I grow in our relationship with Christ, Christ gets bigger. Oh, he doesn't actually get bigger, but our, our vision of him clarifies more. Our understanding of him grows. So he becomes more magnified in our lives and in our understanding. Every year we grow, we will find him to be bigger. Has that been true for you through 2020? Can you say that in all that you have labored through and struggled through and accomplished, that Jesus has grown bigger in your sight, bigger in your love, bigger in your heart. As we enter 2021, we don't know how the measures of relief are going to work. We don't know what kind of totally new challenges are going to happen and whether we're going to be ready for that. But is your view of Jesus big enough? Is your understanding of who he has big enough? Is it, is it just static? Does it change? Does it grow? Uh, is he enhanced in your eyes and in your heart as you live? Or, or are you stalled or are you stuck? What if we began this year and carry through our work this year, asking him for a larger vision of himself? 
as Glenn Scrivener of Speak Life Ministries suggests, to ask the Lord for a larger, a bigger vision of his glory. One of the places that we can begin in scripture towards that is in the final book, the book of Revelation, which I want to read a couple of passages from. I want to start in the first chapter, beginning with verse 1, and I'll let you know where we are. Revelation 1, 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything that he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are all who hear it and take it to heart, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And jumping down to verse 17, when I saw the one who was speaking, I fell at his feet, though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and Hades. And then moving to chapter 2, the second letter to one of the churches, the church at Smyrna, beginning with verse 8. To the, church, to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. And then moving to the end of the book, chapter 21, verse 5. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those, those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God and they will be my people. And finally, Jesus in Revelation 22, 12, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When John records these words, John is in exile on the island of Patmos. It is coming toward the end of the first century. We don't know the circumstances that specifically drove him there, but when you listen to his words in chapter 1, you get the impression that he was there because of his commitment to Christ. He was there as a response to his ministry. He was suffering. He was exiled, uh, and so he was in exile on this island. He, he writes, as he says, as a companion in the suffering and, uh, and the suffering and the kingdom and in patient endurance. Uh, he's not there having a picnic. He, he's not there on a retreat. He is there perhaps banished, uh, sent away. It, it is not a particularly pleasant experience. It's a place of struggle, 
Uh, it's a place where his past had been difficult, his present was uncertain, and John receives a message from Jesus. John receives a message from Jesus, and that message brackets everything else that this book is about. When people think about Revelation, uh, most of the time they think about the great middle section of the book, beginning with the time around the throne of God in Revelation 4 and 5, and then trying to understand all of the events of 6 through 20, and the trumpets and the bowls and the plagues and, and the wars and the beasts and all of the things that are taking place. And, and those are very, very gripping, and many people have sought to explain those in a way that, that we can grasp and understand what Jesus was trying to show his church. But perhaps it would help if we took a step back and, and we looked at how Jesus set the whole picture. He brackets the whole picture of Revelation with a phrase. It's a phrase that is repeated five times in this book. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In chapter 1, verse 8, it's the Lord God picturing the Father who is saying that to us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and is to come. But then, towards the end of Jesus' own introduction of himself to John, he says, I am the living one, I was dead, and look, I am the first and the last, verse 17. To the little church of Smyrna, it was undergoing a severe persecution and struggle. Jesus tells them of encouragement. I am the first and the last, and I know you. I know what you're going through. And then at the end, as he's finishing everything else up, he says it twice. Verse 6 of chapter 21, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then finally in chapter 22, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning, and the end. I believe that Jesus gives to us these words with the hope and the desire that we see him bigger, that we see him more and more for who he is. And this phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega, is a strong declaration of Jesus to us. Like much of Revelation, uh, this is anchored in the Old Testament, and this is specifically from the prophet Isaiah. The setting of the passages in Isaiah that refer to this phrase are when Israel was in exile. Babylon had come, they had destroyed the temple, they had destroyed Jerusalem. Thousands of people had been taken away, thousands of people had been slaughtered and killed. It was an awful time in the history of God's people. But it is in that context that God reminds them who he is. In Isaiah 41, he is the sovereign over all nations. Even the one that he raised up, Babylon, who, who was going to judge Israel. He is the sovereign over all nations. He subdues nations. He silences them. He pursues them. He has called forth all generations from the beginning. And he says, I am Yahweh. I am with the first and I am with the last. I am he, the first and the last. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, this is what Yahweh says, Israel's king and redeemer, Yahweh Almighty, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Contrasting that in the next verses with the, our tendency to set our hopes on everything around us that is physical and all of it that will fail. God alone is the true God. Basing our lives on anything else is ultimately futile. And at the end of the chapter, I, the first and the last, I have redeemed my people. Then in Isaiah 48, verse 12, listen to me, O Judah, Israel, whom I have called. I am he, the first and the last. I began the earth and the heavens. And he's going to say, I will end Babylon, your oppressors. There's a great relevance to us in those verses. Jesus, for John, is the sovereign Lord, and he is the first and the last. He is the Lord over all of the nations. 
No other name is our salvation. He formed this world and he will end Rome. Same message that the Lord brought to Isaiah. I am the first and the last. I brought everything forth and I will end it. Jesus to John, I am the first and the last. I have brought everything forth. I will end Rome. Friends, for you and for me, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's a way, in some sense, to say he's everything. He, he is what really matters. He is all that matters. He is the only thing that matters. He is everything to us, the beginning and the end. He was before anything else came into being. Jesus was the Word who was with God and who was God and who was in the beginning with God. He was the image of the invisible God and he was the firstborn over all creation, Colossians chapter 1, because in him everything was created. The things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities, everything was created through him and for him. He is before all things. Hebrews chapter 1. In his past days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe, the son who is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus is the alpha. Jesus is before all things. In Jesus, all things hold together. He is the one who began all things. Jesus is the alpha. Jesus is the way. John records it, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way for us. He is our pioneer. He is the author of our salvation. And he came to us. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. He comes to us and he ministers to us. He is the Alpha. But Jesus is not just the Alpha. Jesus is also the Omega. He is the last. He was before. He is when all else is done. Who was and now is and who is to come. Jesus is the completer. Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the model. Jesus is the pattern for our lives. Jesus is the, the restorer. All things were made by him, but were corrupted by us. But he is the one who restores. They will be all restored by him and for him to a place of perfect harmony, limitless goodness, lavish abundance, and full peace. When you think about what people deeply want in their deepest heart's desires, can it not be summarized by harmony? The experience of goodness, provision, peace. And yet we look for all of those things in one another, in, in ourselves, in the things of this world, and all of those things are destined to fail. We look in all of the wrong places. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is who we need. He is who we needed then. He is who we need now. He is who we will always need. He came. He was born in Bethlehem. And the birth announcement could not be clearer. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a Savior has been born for you, a Messiah, Christ the Lord. I was taken by that simple phrase that the angels used as they were speaking to the shepherds. I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. It is as the Alpha and the Omega that Jesus really is able to be a Savior for all the people. I think of the people who were directly impacted by Jesus coming. Common peasants, his mom and, uh, and Joseph, who adopted him, his dad. 
the humble laborers, the, the, the shepherds who were given the privilege of being the first ones to see him and the first ones to go and tell about him. They were, they were despised by people. They were not appreciated or esteemed. And yet the Lord chose them to be the first recipients of the birth announcement. The, the foreign dignitaries who came, the magi who had been uh, watching the stars and believing that there was something great going to happen in Israel, pagans from other cultures, and yet they came and they worshipped at the feet of this boy. Senior citizens, often we think of Christmas as a time for, for children, but uh, Christmas is a time for senior citizens when Anna and Simeon are near the temple and Joseph and Mary have brought Jesus up to dedicate him according to the word of the law. It is Simeon who takes Jesus in his arms and say, now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace because I have beheld your salvation. He recognizes who this is, Jesus, a savior for all people. The godless, the godless rulers Mary, in her song, talks about how this message will bring down those who are proud, will send away all of the arrogant and those who serve themselves, the, the godless rulers, the people who depend upon wealth and things of this life. Jesus is a savior for all people. The Alpha and the Omega comes as an offering to, to serve all people, the helpless, the hopeless, the confused, the weary, children, the aged, the oppressed, and those who reject and those who refuse, he at least stands to offer so they cannot say they have never heard. He's not just for all people, but he's for all places, from Galilee in the north, where so much of his ministry took place, to Jerusalem, where he served and ultimately died, the Magi who came from the east, and then Jesus' charge in Luke 24, the repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. All places, all languages. When you turn to Acts chapter 2 and and Pen the Spirit comes and falls at Pentecost and people from all over the Roman Empire hear people talking in their own languages. And when you turn to Revelation chapter 7 and you see the crowd gathered from around the throne from every tribe and every tongue, all nations and all periods of time, from the present to those before, one of the, the most striking aspects of the gospel is that it also works backward. It doesn't just work from the cross forward. It works from the cross backward because everyone who truly trusted God, Jesus' sacrifice covers them. It goes back and covers them as well. And so the, the Jesus is for people in the past and in the present and certainly in the future for all times of history until Jesus comes back. Matthew 24, verse 14, the gospel of the good news of Christ, what he has done for us will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. Jesus is sufficient for all times, for all people, for all places, for all languages, for all times, for all seasons of life. As we looked at in Psalm 90 and talked about life, the Lord is sufficient for all seasons of life, and not just for all seasons of life, but for every year of life. And we have we not needed him so much over this past year. I would ask again, has your view of Jesus grown over this last year? Have you experienced him in deeper and stronger ways through all of the challenges of 2020? I, I don't know about you, friend, but that's what I need. I need to see him bigger. And, and I believe that you need to see him bigger as well. And I believe that people need to see in me and in you that we see him bigger, that there is a, a growing vision of Christ in our lives and our hearts a growing willingness to speak of him in our mouths, a, a growing trust in him in the circumstances of life, a larger vision of his glory 
a clearer understanding of his will, a fuller portion of his love, a stronger resting in his hands. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega who does not change the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our stability and he is our strength. And it is he who is sovereign over the year that we enter. And it's certainly we have needed to know that and rest in that in the year that we have just completed. But certainly we need to know that and grow in that as this new year dawns. As we wrap up this morning, I just have a question for you. Do you remember who you were before you came to know the Lord? and who you thought he was, what you thought about him then. Do you remember where you were, what you were before? And at a point in time, the message of Christ came to you. The light went on. The Lord it brought you to faith, and you trusted him, and your relationship with him began. And all of a sudden, he exploded into glory into your life and into your understanding. And he became so huge. And you and I, we become then appropriately very, very small before him. Do you remember where you were? Do you remember how Jesus reached to you and who he used to do that? Do you believe that there are people in your life who are today where you were then. And that maybe you are a tool that the Lord would use to help them understand in a new way who Jesus is. And that you would be willing to be there. That you would be willing to answer their questions. Or maybe you would be willing to even ask them some questions. That you would be willing to reach out in compassion and kindness and gentleness and, and speak to them what others have spoken to you so that Jesus might grow for them even as he grows for you and for me. Friends, one of the ways that our view of Jesus can keep growing is as we continue to understand who he is and we meditate on and then think about the reality of Jesus, the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the Alpha, the Omega, who was and is and is to come, who does not change, and who is with us faithfully yesterday, today, and forever. If you know me, you know one of my favorite stories is A Christmas Carol. And A Christmas Carol is the story of the transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge, one of the, the worst mean-spirited misers that you want to meet, to a man who describes his life this way, I will keep Christmas every day. When he says, I will keep Christmas every day, he does not mean that he's going to do presents every day and meals every day and feasts every day. And he means that he's going to show kindness every day. He's going to treat people with respect and he's going to love people every day. I would offer to you that, that the, the name, the phrase is not a bad phrase. We might, we might describe it differently. But that you and I can keep Christmas, the reality of Christmas every day by allowing Jesus to grow in our heart every day by allowing him to transform us more and more every day, to seek him every day, to serve him every day, to look for opportunities to speak of him every day. And the life that Jesus wants to have born in us because he came for us, he lived for us, he died on the cross for us, he was raised for us, he went to glory for us, he is praying and interceding for us, and he is going to come back and take us to be with him. Oh, that our love of him will grow every day. Our appreciation of him will grow every day. Our longing for him will grow every day. And in each of those ways, he will get bigger and bigger and bigger, not because he's increasing, but because we're getting closer to him 
and we're seeing him more clearly. We're loving him more dearly. We're following him more nearly. As this year begins, Jesus has gone before us. He has prepared it for us to enter. Will you trust him to draw alongside of you? And will you draw alongside him that he would prepare you to enter the year that he has prepared for us now? Let's pray. Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And those words were to be a great encouragement to John and to the believers, even and especially in the midst of all that was going to be happening in the intervening chapters of Revelation. They are all set in the context of your sovereign person and your sovereign love. And there is ultimately no question about how things will end. Oh, Lord, would you grow our appreciation of you? Would you grow our devotion to you? Would you grow our longing for you and our serving you and our willingness to open our mouths to speak of you? Oh, Lord, this will be a glorious year if you will accomplish those things in us and for us. We thank you for that now. In your most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it's time to gather at the table of the Lord. If it is a time that you are finishing because you did not prepare for that this morning, God bless you and strengthen you as this new year begins. I would love to hear from you this week if there's any way that we can pray for you uh, and encourage you. But for those of you who are planning to participate together in the Lord's Supper, uh, I hope that you have your bread and your cup present. Uh, Let's pray for a moment as we get ready to partake together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is good to come to the table of the Lord together as the year begins, because it reminds us of the grace that is new for us and fresh every year, the the grace that comes to us through your death on the cross on our behalf There is no expiration date. There is no best if used by date. But it's rather a fresh supply and a replenishment. And at the beginning of this year, it's always a good time for us to remember that we have committed our lives to you. And we want to renew that as we tell you uh, this morning, even at the beginning of this year. That as we gather at the table, that as we think afresh about what you did for us on the cross, we remember your act of redemption and we remember our faith in trusting you. We want to say this is a new year, Lord. and We start afresh as yours. And so we thank you for that today. Would you meet us here now in the bread and the cup? We pray in your most holy name. Amen. At the beginning of the year, John Wesley would often have a service that he called a covenant service. And it was a service of worship specifically designed as an annual event to to renew in our own hearts and minds that we have received the covenant agreement that God has promised to us. And we receive that by reflecting it back and repeating and re-owning the covenant that we have made to him in our faith and belonging to him. The covenant that God promised to us was pictured in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system, where he made a promise that through the shedding of the blood of an innocent substitute, that our sin would be forgiven and we would be cleansed. 
And it is through the death of Christ on the cross that that is offered to you and to me. We do not have to slay an animal. We do not have to pour out the blood, but we act on the substitute, the sacrifice that the Lord has made for us in himself. For his body on the cross is the lamb, the lamb of God who gave his life to take away the sin of the world. And the cup that we drink symbolizes the, the blood that he shed and the, the death that he died on our behalf. His blood was our death. So his death was our death. So his life can be our life. And so we remember that through the eating of bread and through the drinking from this cup. Jesus instituted that uh, at the Last Supper when he was with his disciples. He took the bread that had been prepared. He blessed it and he broke it. And he passed it around saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As you eat, think back to the body of Christ, bruised, crushed, beaten on the cross, and that he suffered there for you. Eat in Jesus' name. Amen. After supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant which is made for you through the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of your sin. Jesus died in our place. His blood, his death signified that. And our drinking the cup testifies that we have received that death through our faith and therefore are cleansed by his blood. This blood is the blood of the covenant, which is through my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Let us drink. Heavenly Father, thank you the beginning of this year, we know that through Christ you have given to us all that we will need as this year develops. And we would just like to tell you that we renew our commitment to you. You showed such a commitment to us in sending Jesus for us. We thank you for that today. Strengthen us and receive us into your service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you this morning for joining us here at the beginning of the year. May Jesus grow large in your heart and in your eyes. May you grow in confidence because he is eternal. He does not change. He is the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, and he has made himself available for you. That he might walk with you and uh, strengthen you to walk with him. Grow in his grace. Amen.